Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Peggy O'Neill, the Adult Services Programming Librarian at Penfield Library. And I'm delighted this afternoon to welcome Michelle Gross, who's a member of the Rochester chapter of the Hearing Loss Association of America. Michelle has done various programs. Um, this is, I think, the first one for um, us here at the library. You, but I know you've done many other programs um, on um, hearing loss and what it involves. And so without further ado, um, I'll take, have you take it over, Michelle? Oh, we just, uh, if you have anything in the chat too, if you have any questions, you can put those in the chat or unmute yourself. So Michelle, without further ado, you're on. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm, I'm a very in, informal type person. So um, it, it will be kind of an informal sure. presentation. Uh, it's, uh, if you would like to, the, this meeting is captioned. So if you turn on your captions, if you've set that up in your um, preferences, you should see on your screen, and depending on the device that you're using, you might see a CC that says live transcript or just a small CC. And if you click on it, you can see, um, you can have the captions if you need them. Uh, they're, they're very helpful. So that would be good. Um, I, I think today I'd like to say that the most important part of my presentations or my talks is that people get their questions answered, uh, that they get information that is useful to them because very often what happens, there'll be a program on a topic and people go away saying, well, you know, that was good, interesting. I enjoyed it. It was good, but I had questions and I still have the same questions. So I'm not an audiologist and I'm not a doctor, but uh, my background is uh, as a physical therapist. And I was also the hearing conservationist at the United States Postal Service. I know it sounds weird. Mm -hmm. So I have administered uh, hearing screening tests and uh, my hearing issues began as when I was about eight or nine years old due to an illness. So I have a lot of experience both with hearing aids and um, assistive devices. I've been a member of HLAA in, uh, in New York City and then in Rochester for, I don't know, 10 or, I don't know, maybe 15 years or so. So that gives me some kind of experience and uh, ability to answer some questions. So if I say something that prompts your brain to have, you know, uh, stimulates you to ask a question, please feel free. You can either raise your hand or put it in the chat or, um, you know, if there's not too many people, just kind of mm -hmm. start talking. And uh, that way we're sure that you get your questions answered. Um, First, a little bit about HLAA. Pam, I believe you said you belong to the Colorado chapter. Um, no, you don't. I uh, joined at the national level. I'm oh, okay. probably going to move back to California. So I found some really good groups all over the country because it's remote. <laughs> so yeah, I, actually, I'm not sure where uh, I'm going to. Yeah, actually, California has a number of excellent chapters. Um, which is good. And because of being remote, you are right. It, you can kind of tune in anywhere. The good thing about HLAA is uh, because we're a, we're a nonprofit organization and the only, we're all made up of volunteers at the local level. At the national level, we have a few paid people, but at the local level, everybody's a volunteer. And we're kind of, a, at least in Rochester and I think other chapters too, kind of um, we're not a crying towel group, you know, it's not like we sit and bemoan our fate about hearing loss. It's really that uh, we're interested in motivating and helping other people, um, you know, gain some security in uh, issues of hearing loss and also family issues uh, and friends issues because they don't seem to get it very often. If you're a hearing person, it's very difficult. You can imagine Hearing people seem to be able to manage, uh, imagine what it's like being deaf, but they can't imagine what it's like having uh, being hard of hearing, having some kind of a hearing loss other than deaf. So I guess for them, it's kind of all and nothing. 
Mm. Second of all, we're sort of uh, being hard of hearing is creates not only a frustration for us, for the people that have it, but it's frustrating for it, uh, other people who interact with us often, depending on the degree of hearing loss and how people manage their own hearing loss. And as a result, very often people, they don't, it, it's not a kind of a disability that garners much sympathy from people. And it's not that we're looking for sympathy, but often you're looking for understanding. So HLAA uh, can help with that because we're all in the same boat. We have patience with each other. We'll repeat when necessary. We do what's necessary to, to get the job done. So it's, it's, like, it's like a family. So it is uh, helpful to, to uh, be able to, um, to join. Now, everybody is uh, kind of is on their own path when it comes to hearing loss because uh, some people are born with hearing loss, either deaf or they're born with it, or uh, for one reason or another, or it's acquired. Some hearing loss can be temporary, some uh, it can be permanent. Sometimes there's medical treatment and sometimes there's not. But in the whole, if you take the general uh, picture of hearing loss, it generally is, uh, hearing loss generally comes on gradually and uh, does not, is not amenable to many medical treatments often, and often it does progress. So it's kind of the worst case scenario happens the most frequently. So it's especially, it can be especially uh, frustrating. It's also that people in the beginning, people might not even realize they have a hearing loss because it's subtle and there is, it's hidden, it's not obvious. So what happens is you start, if you start noticing on your end, if you're the person with the hearing loss, you start noticing that you're asking for people to repeat things more than you ever used to. You might have other people complaining uh, nowadays, if you can have company with this COVID thing, but um, that you're, they might complain you're listening to your television too loudly, or that you're speaking too loudly, or sometimes what happens is you're answering a question that nobody asked because you heard something and you thought it was a question and you answered, then all of a sudden people look at you and say, what, you know, what, where did they get that from? So it, it has a certain sense of, um, where you feel kind of unsure in many situations. And that creates, can create a sense of not wanting to branch out, not wanting to participate because it's just anxiety producing and you don't wanna to have to go through that. So gradually you may find that you start withdrawing from certain activities, um, especially in larger groups. And now with uh, COVID in a way, it's sort of convenient that you have a reason not to gather in, uh, in groups. But, you know, when you go to uh, your house of worship and there's other people, you may not hear the sermon or any of the other service clearly. Um, and so you, you may start to suspect that you have a hearing loss. And that's generally the way it comes about. Either you suspect it because of your own difficulty or you, uh, you're, somebody is telling you that you uh, have a hearing loss. So the question is what happens after that? There's always, an, there's kind of an activation barrier before you get yourself going into doing something about it. And it's uh, studies have been done that estimate it takes about seven years from the time that you think that you have a hearing loss to you actually do something about it. So the question is, well, what do you do about it? Uh, you can go to your primary care doctor, your main physician. That is okay and may get the ball rolling, but very often they really haven't had much of experience uh, dealing with uh, people with hearing loss, and they try to do an in-office test. So you're sitting there in the office and they say, can you hear me? Well, you know, you're sitting a foot across from them. Yes, you can hear them. Okay, your hearing is normal. Or they put a watch by your ear. Can you hear this ticking? And, you know, that's really not a sat satisfactory test either. So if you want the gold standard in testing, um, generally you go to a uh, 
an audiologist or an ENT and uh, ear, nose, and throat doctor. And the e in the ENT's office, they generally have their own uh, audiologist working for them. Um, it used to be you'd have to go to the doctor before you could go to the audiologist. The audiologist um, couldn't take you just off the street. So that's no longer the case. They can see you off the street and so to speak uh, by appointment, of course, and uh, they can test your hearing. Uh, and it's good to have them do that kind of first in a way because they are educated to uh, recognize a situation where there might be a medical problem that needs intervention. So there's certain tumors that can occur either uh, at, at the brain level or someplace in the ear, or they can look in there and see you have an infection or you know whatever. So they can refer you back uh, to someone, but um, they also do the most comprehensive hearing testing in audiologist's office. The downside, of course, is it's pricey. You know, the gold standard is the audiologist, but, you know, you also pay, and depending on your insurance, they may or may not pay for the testing. Um, Medicare sometimes pays for the testing, but doesn't pay for anything else. Uh, there is legislation pending to try to uh, fix that situation, but it's sort of in limbo right now. Uh, so then the next step is to determine uh, what to do. And if your hearing loss reaches a certain uh, level of, uh, of loss during, after the various tests, then it may be suggested you get a hearing aid. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, hearing tests. Uh, have you all had hearing tests? Uh, no? Okay, I'm going to try to share a screen now. This is a task. I'm just practicing, so bear with me. I'd like to show you um, a, an image of um, an, uh, just a plain, ordinary uh, audiogram. So let me see if I can do this. I'm going to share this with you. You should be able to see this, I think, on your screen in a minute. Okay, I don't know, can you see that? Yes, you can see, okay. What you're looking at is what the audiologist fills in when they're doing a hearing test. Up at the top are the various frequencies or pitches. And down on this left side, this is the standard, um, is, uh, is the decibel level. Now the decibel is actually a physics measurement of pressure. I don't understand it because I'm not a physics person. So if you are a physics person and you'd like to go, you know, look about decibels as they apply to hearing, that's good, but I won't be able to, to do that here. But what you will get is with experience, you get to know your own hearing loss and what these things mean. So you might have zero means uh, at, at 100. So this would mean at 125 Hertz, if you had here, let me see if I can um, do this here. Uh, da -da, let me see here where I am. I'm looking for, uh, let me see. I'm trying to look, they have a, uh, uh, okay. Um, they have a method by which you can um, look at you, the pattern of your hearing loss. And that will tell you, or that will tell your, your uh, audiologist what your hearing is like. And if you look over here on the, on, way over in the left, um, you can see they give you the various hearing losses and what it means at what level. 
what normal hearing is, what mild is, sort of the definition of all those things. So I'm going to um, stop this. And what I'm going to put on now is I'm going to show you a filled in um, audiogram. So let me see if I can get that up here. Okay, and now you should see, this is what it looks like when the audiologist does your test. The convention is the right ear is always represented by red, and generally the, the left ear is represented by either blue or black, usually blue. Uh, and that convention is maintained no matter what you do with hearing. So for example, when you get hearing aids, uh, on part, someplace on your hearing aid or the ear mold, you're, it, it's going to be some lettering that's going to be either red or blue. That helps you to know what right or left is, which hearing aid you're holding, if you can't figure it out any other way. And all the conventions um, use that. So you can see here that in this case, this person has normal hearing up at 250 hertz. Uh, when it gets to about 1,000 hertz, it goes down to 10, and then gradually becomes steeper and steeper until you get to 8,000, where they have a 70 decibel hearing loss, which is considerately considered uh, severe, moderately severe to severe. So you can see, and that's in both ears. So that's basically what it's telling the person. It's good to kind of see this now, because after you have your hearing tested, it's always a good idea to ask the audiologist for a copy of this audiogram, because it may be helpful in the future if you go to a different audiologist or um, you go to your doctor, plus you can keep track yourself of what your own audiogram looks like. So now I'm gonna end this and I'm going to show you um, another diagram and let me get this going and all right um this one okay this one strangely enough is called the speech banana and that's actually its name and of course you can't guess why but <laughs> this yellow is represents that area and these letters represent both the frequency and the decibel level you need, that is the loudness you need to hear these various letters. So up here in the high frequency, which is 4,000, um, are your syllabins, the F, the TH and the S, so those words that start with F, S, and TH, because they're high frequency, if you have a high frequency hearing loss are gonna be the most difficult for you to hear. So women's voices tend to be in the higher frequencies. So if you have this high frequency loss, you may hear men's voices better than, hearing, than women's voices. If you go on to the consonants, you can see there at the lower frequencies, 500 Hertz, um, 250 uh, Hertz. And so that's why you may hear men's voices better. And this just again shows where normal hearing is. If you go across, this would be mild up to 30 or 35, moderate would be across this way. So that's just kind of a general view. You, you know, and it, this is the kind of thing that I wouldn't expect you uh, you know, really to remember, but um, it's good to see it because uh, that way when the audiologist or when you see your own test, as I said, you can keep track of it and it's not going to look so strange the first time you see it. So it's not that this is, you have to memorize this. It's just so that you see. Um, that's only one test that the audiologists do. That's called the pure tone um, audiometer test. And that's when you sit in a booth 
a, a sound attenuated booth and you either press a button or raise your hand every time a sound you hear a sound that's presented to your ear. You'll also get speech tests where the, the audiologist will ask you, you'll hear some words and the audiologist will ask you to repeat them. Um, sometimes they seem, gee, this is easy, you know, and no problem at all. Um, and then there's other speech tests that say, you know, I'm not so sure what this person said, you know, what the audiologist said. So when you go to an audiologist, they do those tests. They do the speech threat, the uh, audiometric test, the, the uh, pure tone test, speech tests. Uh, and they also do tests to see if your eardrum is intact or if you have fluid behind your ear. There's all kinds of tests they can do um, to determine the kind of hearing loss you have, where it's taking place anatomically, and how severe it is. Uh, and that gives them a clue. I will show you one more diagram here. Uh, may be of interest. Well, it's not really a diagram, it's a picture. So um, let me see now, we'll get that going. Uh, okay. Here's a picture of an ear. And what you'll see here is the various parts of the ear. And depending on where the hearing loss occurs, uh, that sort of gives you the um, idea of what type, what type of hearing loss you can you have and how you would hear with that type of hearing loss. So, for example, um, let me see here. Uh, Going to use this. Okay. So if you have a hearing loss anywhere from the outside of your ear to this green thing, um, that's the considered part of the external ear. And what you may have there, sometimes this is blocked by earwax. And so the sound, this is your eardrum. It, it can't get to the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. It, uh, some people might develop a, a tumor in this area. Some children are born with what they call an atresia of the ear canal. That is, this is glued together or it doesn't exist. So that, uh, that will give you um, a certain kind of hearing loss. This over here, um, let me see, let me get rid of this. Um, This area here is your middle ear. This area from behind the eardrum, you see there's three little bones here. Those are the ossicles. This is your eustachian tube. You know, when you go flying in a plane, this is the thing that closes off or gets plugged and plugs up your ears. That's this. So that eustachian tube, one end is connected to your middle ear. The other end is connected to your throat. Um, so if you get fluid in there, eventually it can drain into your throat. So if you have a hearing loss from, uh, if you have a hearing loss anywhere um, from the outside of your ear to where this green bone is, this is your stapes, then it's called a conductive hearing loss. Oh, sorry about that. Um, fortunately, my husband will pick it up probably the only time he picks up the phone. Um, so if you have a conductive loss, um, you can understand speech if it's loud enough. If you have a hearing loss that takes place um, back here uh, in this area where the cochlea is, Oop, I pushed the wrong thing. I wanted the area, uh, the uh, arrow, where the, these are your semicircular canals. These have to do with balance. This here is your cochlea. You've probably heard of that. That's where they do a cochlear implant. 
this nerve here, and these are connected to your, your eighth cranial nerve, which is also called the hearing nerve. Um, and this is your balance nerve, your vestibular nerve. So if you have a hearing loss in this area or involved in your brain, then you have what's called a sensorial neural hearing loss. It's affecting um, that part of your uh, ear that um, connects the uh, inner ear, the cochlea with your brain. So, um, and in that case, if you, that's where most, most hearing loss uh, in people as you're getting older, that's progressive, takes place in here, in the cochlea. That's where everybody talks about hair cells uh, getting lost. They're not really hair, hair cells, but they, uh, they call them that um, because they look like hair cells. So that's kind of anatomically where uh, hearing loss takes place. And depending on where your hearing loss is happening determines what you need to hear. Um, I, um, so anyway, sorry about that. Um, so let me, I'm going to close this now. Do you have any questions about this? It's kind of, you know, sciencey, but I think it might be good. Pam? I, I do. Um, I don't know. I don't think I have the thing to raise my hand. Sorry. That's okay. Um, don't worry about it. I just had a test where they spoke sentences to me in a hearing booth and they introduced recorded other people's voices as background noise and asked me to repeat as many of the words in each sentence as I could. Do you know what kind of test that is? Uh, generally, um, there's a variety of speech tests. Um, usually they use single words, uh, but depending on how you respond to the single words, they may use the, the sentences. That's kind of what, the, what might be determined a real world test because some of these tests, you're sitting in a booth, it's, it's sound attenuated, and it's not real world. Um, it's not like being outside where there's background noise and whatever. Those kinds of tests, generally, they don't do as a first line test because you're not obtaining um, your, a baseline of where your, your hearing is. I've they had may, hearing aids for 10 years. So. Yeah, oh, okay. So they may be using that to kind of uh, uh, see how, did you, were you wearing your hearing aids when you had the test? It was, I did with and without. Both. Yeah. Um, did they put a, an electrode in your ear when they did this test? I didn't think so. <laughs> okay, they, think they so. may or may not. And the reason why I'm asking um, that gives some information of how, how clearly your hearing aids are picking up sound. And it's, so it's a legitimate test. It's not one of the most frequent ones. What you should get um, when you get new hearing uh, aids is called a real ear test. What that is, is you're in the audiologist's office. They stick, you're wearing your hearing aids. They put a little electrode into your ear. And then you hear some gobbledygook. You might hear like, it might be sentences. It might be part of sentences. It might not make any sense. And what they're doing there is they're listening to how the hearing aid is really working, how it's producing the sounds it should produce for you. That is a very important test. And it should be given by any audiologist after uh, once you get your hearing aids. Well, that indicates the... that your audiologist is giving you, um, you know, a complete test. Uh, some places don't use audiologists, like, uh, for example, Miracle Ear. Uh, in most cases, don't use audiologists to do their testing. They use hearing dispensers. Hearing dispensers are uh, certified people, um, usually by their state. Well, states differ. And they know about hearing aids, but they are not medically trained. So they do only a subset of tests necessary to kind of fit you with a hearing aid, 
but it's not really that you don't get all the fine points um, that you would with an audiologist. Um, and so it's okay, but it's not the gold standard. So, uh, but that real ear test where they actually put the electrode in after you get your hearing aids doesn't hurt. I mean, you don't even know it's there, but um, that, uh, that indicates that you're getting um, a, a, a test. So, I um, mean, a true test. I'm um, in the process of getting, of, I'm in the trial period of new hearing aids and I now I have severe hearing loss. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to thank you because I've been going to reputable ear practices, not just Costco or something for probably 20 years. And nobody ever explained like you have the audiogram and all those things. They just said you have hearing loss at high frequencies, period. Or yeah. the, it, the, I mean, it, 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 you know, some of these medical things just annoy me. Um, I was a physical therapist in my career. Um, and I think what happens is, is that uh, the medical establishment it's kind of dumbed, dumbs down what they tell people. They don't, just because you didn't go to medical school and you don't know the terminology doesn't mean they can explain it. They can't explain it in a way that makes sense and not in some kind of childish way. And that happens very often in the medical establishment. And I hate to say it, they do it even more as you get older because they just figure you get old, you get dumb. You know, they just don't. Uh, and I find that very frustrating. So yes, uh, having a copy of your autogram, Legally, they have to give it to you. They might tell you, well, you don't need it as part of our records. Well, illegally, it's your record. It is your medical record. And you are entitled to have copies of your medical records. I have copies, but they just like point to it and say, you have severe hearing loss. They don't explain the axis, the X and Y axis, like you do. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And um, as you become more and more familiar with it, even if um, you know you generally get to know your own hearing, and then as you see your tests, you see where you fall. Um, the other, there are other tests they do. The ones for the eardrum and all that; those are pressure tests and whatever, and they don't have as much meaning for us. Um, but the the audiometric test um, you should have a copy of, and you should keep track. And if you don't understand it. This is something that's really, really important, um, especially when you're, if you're entering into the world of hearing loss, you've got to grow guts. You've got to become courageous. You have to ask, you know, don't let somebody pass on without provide, without you understanding what they said, um, because this can happen very often when you have a hearing loss and you enter into the medical establishment, you may not hear what someone says. And so you say, yeah, you know, I didn't hear it, but I don't wanna ask again. And what do I say? I don't really understand it. Um, when you introduce yourself to, let's say you go to the emergency room or you go to a new doctor, any kind of new practitioner, part of um, telling them who you are, you tell them, you have a hearing loss. So I would say, um, happy to meet you. They come in, they say, I'm Dr. Jones. And you say, hi, Dr. Jones. I'm Michelle Gross and I have a hearing loss. So what I need you to do, and then you follow up by what you know will help you. I need you to face me when you speak with me um, or if you need them to speak up a little bit, um, you tell them. Um, you'll find that the doctors with the computers, you go in and okay, they're doing something and the, okay, I know you have, my audiologist does this. I go into the audiologist, he takes out the hearing aids and then he's talking to me. Okay, I can lip read a little bit, but you know, that's not going to be helpful. Or uh, I notice I go to the audiologist and my hearing is, you know, pretty severe. So what happens is He's making me a new ear mold. So he's got his back turned to me and I see his jaw just going. 
I don't hear him. So I say to him, you know, if you're talking to me, you'll have to turn around. If you're talking to someone in your office, that's okay. You're enti- you've got your privacy, but you have to speak up because otherwise they don't know. Um, well, I feel like I hold up my end, but it's like pulling teeth. They're exactly. the ones with the education. They should have, and they've been, they do this as their full-time job. They should have a presentation. They should have in your mind what the pa- their mind what the patient needs to know, and they always thought, "Do you have any questions?" Well, I don't really know enough to have. That's that's a very important issue. Now, let me uh, I'll ask you another uh, a question. Do you have a telecoils? Do you have telecoils in your hearing aids? Uh, in the new ones, yes. I haven't tried them because uh, I can't find a tele. I mean, the churches have loops and I've just learned that that was a good thing to have. But okay. for 15 years, I did not. This, this is an issue that um, when I used to do presentations live, you know, in, those, in large groups, I'd ask people, how many of you have a telecoil? And then I'd say, what's she saying? What's she saying? What's a telecoil? Because the audiologists don't tell people about telecoils. They don't tell them whether they have them or not. They don't tell them what they do, how to use them, anything like that. We've had this discussion with many excellent audiologists, and sometimes they don't even order. They have to order them in most in many hearing aids. Um, most of them nowadays come with it, but not all of them. So I, we've asked them, why don't you tell people about the telecoil? because it is our, one of our most useful devices. And their response is, and that there is some truth to this, that when I tell people that about their hearing loss and they're gonna need, going to need hearing aids, they become overwhelmed. And then when I'm explaining how to use the hearing aids, it's a volume of information and people can't absorb all that information. Um, and, that, and that part is true. But our response from HLAA and my personal response is that's okay if the person only comes to see you once. But if you want to have a relationship with your patient, at some point along the way, you have to educate them as to what they have and how to use it because it helps them in their everyday life. So this is a constant battle that we go through uh, with uh, with uh, And I can't. Oh, Tell when they're they're making decisions for me, and but I don't, I I don't know that they're doing that. I got a telecoil by accident because I decided not to get rechargeable, but take battery, and the audiologist picked out a certain model, and just as I was leaving, paying and leaving, she said, she said something about. She picked the one that had telecoil in it. So I had to go back and see what, she didn't tell me what it did, but yeah, I could I go think, on and on. And you said you didn't, you were not a crying towel. So. Well, no, 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 no. A crying towel is a different thing. Um, what, what the whole purpose of HLAA in this presentation is to provide some education is to know how to interact with the audiologist because you said you've had hearing aids a long time and they're still treating you like you know nothing. I mean, <laughs> that's not the way it should be practiced, of course. Uh, medicine should be practiced. But uh, as you also said, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. so um, uh, I think- That's a good, what, what I'll you're remember saying, that line. <laughs> well, what you're saying is extremely important um, and is a big issue for people uh, working with the medical establishment in general, but especially for people with hearing loss, because, you know, if you don't hear what the person's saying, or you don't hear it correctly, uh, not only don't you get the information, but very often your imagination fills in. And your imagination can be pretty scary because, you know, you just kind of fill in the blanks with whatever your brain fills it in with. So the whole idea is, um, yes, asking questions is important, but that's, again, where HLAA comes in, because as we we, uh, have a good, as an organization, we have excellent relationships with the audiologists, we speak freely with them, and we often tell them, if you can't take the time 
to talk to your patient or you think they're becoming overwhelmed, you know, tell them to contact us, provide them with our uh, contact information and we will help them. And then those people like you um, and Gwen um, can help other people uh, because now you've, you've been provided with information and so you now know what to do. Uh, here's some interesting information about hearing aids, which I will mention. First of all, most people or many people when they first get hearing aids uh, are often very disappointed because they expect hearing aids to be like glasses. You know, you put on a pair of glasses, you can see. You put in hearing aids, you can't necessarily hear. I mean, it's they don't cure hearing loss. And uh, it's very confusing, not only for the disappointing or anger producing for the person who gets the hearing aids and therefore they may take the hearing aids out, put them in a drawer and that's the end. Um, and the second reason is that if a family member or friend uh, looks at you and says, well, you got, you tell them you can't hear them or you don't understand them, they look at you, well, you have hearing aids, you know, maybe the hearing aids are no good. So the bottom line is hearing the sound enters your ear, as we saw, and passes through the various aspects of your ear but it has to be processed by your brain. And people's brains process hearing differently. So you and I can have the exact same audiogram, but it doesn't mean we're hearing the same thing. Part of the reason is, for example, we have different backgrounds. I have kind of a medical type background. So if somebody says something that uses uh, medical terminology and I didn't quite hear them, my brain is thinking, what could they have said medically? Uh, and kind of puts that together. If, you, if someone is, let's say you are an artist and never was a, were a medical person, you may never have come across that word. You never might not understand the phrasing and your brain can't quite process what you've heard. So even though our hearing loss is the same, we're not necessarily hearing the same thing. And that's something that um, is extremely important to hear, that we hear with our brains as much as we hear with our ears. And that can be kind of a relief on, uh, to some people uh, to know that it's not an intellect issue. Uh, and speaking of intellect and brains, one more uh, point that may be of interest. You probably, you may have come across information from AARP and other places that there is an association between, they're finding an association between hearing loss and Alzheimer's. And people kind of panic about that because um, it appears that people with hearing loss uh, seem to have a more, a little bit more of a propensity to develop uh, a dementia of one sort or another, maybe Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. That may be true, but it's not the whole story. And it's not the whole story for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, if a person who needs hearing aids gets hearing aids, it allows their brain to stay involved, to stay engaged. And, uh, you know, it's the use it or lose it kind of kind of philosophy. So that goes a long way in helping a person maintain uh, brain function um, and may be associated with um, pe those people who have a hearing loss and don't have it addressed uh, and becoming isolated may add to that. Uh, tendency towards a dementia. The other issue is uh, as people get older and they may go into a nursing home situation or whatever, um, not hearing may be confused with dementia. And I think I'm going to share one more screen with you. Uh, let me see if I have that. Yes, I do. 
Um, so let me do this and this. All right, if you look, okay, on the left are some of the symptoms or whatever of Alzheimer's disease and untreated hearing loss. And you can see, let me move, I don't know how this got in there, but um, you can see how they relate. Um, th there's overlap in almost every category. Um, and by the way, down here at the bottom, it says the National Council for Better Hearing. I've tried to look this place up and I can't find it, but in any, <laughs> in any case, you can see that um, why that may happen. If somebody doesn't hear, um, they're, they're not going to be responding to somebody uh, talking to them, and it may, or they may respond in an inappropriate way. There is something called um, oronyms, O R, I think it's O R O Y, no, O R Y N. I am S, I think. I, I don't remember how to spell it. What those, what that is are words um, and often sentences that sound alike and can be confused. So for example, um, if somebody says, I like those gray pants, you may hear somebody say, I like those great plants. And if you have a hearing loss, and somebody says, I like those gray pants. And you say, oh, yes, I love those plants too. I water them all the time. And that's why they're growing. They look at you and they sing. And that's an oronym. And hearing uh, people with hearing loss do that all the time. Uh, people even who don't have hearing loss, sometimes that happens. But it happens all the time with people with hearing loss. And it's a cause for embarrassment. And that embarrassment begets anxiety. And that anxiety makes a person with hearing loss not want to speak up under certain circumstances. They might not want to go to a group um, event where they're going to misunderstand speech or, uh, or be laughed at, or people are, you know, it's it. And so you start becoming more and more isolated. So, what I'd like to do um, kind of nearing the end here, I'm gonna get rid of this. Um, uh, there are a number of things that a, a person can do um, to, uh, to kind of help some tips that kind of help um, when you're dealing with hearing loss. First of all, um, if you need hearing aids, you get hearing aids, ask questions of your audiologist. If your hearing aid is not working properly, if it's not comfortable, if it hurts you, if it buzzes, if it squeals, um, if it itches, if you have uh, itching in the, of the ear mold, uh, if sound is fuzzy, whatever, all of those can be addressed and more by an audiologist. So don't suffer, go back. You're probably entitled to some revisits, go back and speak up and have the audiologist address them. And if you have to go back more than once, go back more than once. Um, if you need assistive devices, like I have, um, I have here my hearing loop to use. Um, this plugs into, um, it can plug into a hearing and a hearing device like this or like this, an assistive listening device. Um, I have a mini mic for my hearing aid, which I can use. I put that around my neck and it's like a microphone that people can talk into. They can wear it and then it goes right into my ears using the either Bluetooth or um, uh, or my, you know, the telecoil. So if you need a device, I have a caption telephone. Uh, I use my, um, my app on my phone to control my hearing aids, uh, which you can do nowadays. There's all kinds of gadgets and gizmos 
that you can use. And one of the things that we do at HLAA is help people work through learning how to use all of those devices because it's complex. And sometimes you think you have to be an engineer to just listen to somebody from across the room. But um, just so that you know these things are available to help you here um, is important. Uh, you probably want to you want to continue to socialize. Usually, it's easiest to socialize on a one-on-one, -on -one where you're facing the person. Again, remind people to face you when they talk to you. Make sure the light is on the face of the speaker and not in your eyes, so you can, uh, for lip reading purposes. If you live with someone, uh, they can't talk to you from another room um, because you're not going to hear them. If you're wearing hearing aids, remind them you will never hear a whisper. So if you're wearing hearing aids and they try to whisper sweet nothings in your ear, forget it. Um, so all these little things are very helpful. And, and there are more. Um, you are welcome. Um, one more thing I will show you because it's we're just about out of time here. Um, so I'm going to open this and I'm going to share. Um, I, um, I happen to be the webmaster of our chapter. And I also am the person who answers the emails for the chapter. So if for some reason you ever want to contact me or you want to visit our website or whatever, uh, this is our contact information. Um, uh, the national organization is Hearing Loss Association of America and they're hearingloss.org. Our local chapter, I try to get a, a name for it that makes sense. So it's hearinglossrochester.org, hearinglossrochester.org, all one word. You don't really even need the HTTPS and the www, your browser will open it up or put it into Google and we'll come up Hearing Loss Rochester. Um, and you can go to find the rest of the contact information on our website. Um, so, uh, okay, I guess that's that's about it for, and I know it's just a couple minutes left before I guess we may get cut off. I don't know what the library has. Yes, no, Gwen. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. This was wonderful, Michelle. Sure, okay. let's have Gwen. Gwen, you had a question? question. You're muted, so. Then you'll just have to read my lips, right? <laughs> Go at it. Um, I wonder, does your association, your organization, have a list of audiologists that you've either worked with or that you know are qualified and on the up and up? Okay, are you in Rochester? Yes. Okay. Um, all the uh, usually um, audiologists are licensed by the state, uh, so all the audi audiologists will be licensed. At least in New York State, they're licensed. All of the ones in Rochester are really good audiologists. It's not really the audiologists. There are only like four hearing aid uh, manufacturers. They make all the hearing aids and sell them under different names. It's knowing the baffle gab of the insurance to help pay and how it works. Um, so, and, and audiologists can't carry every brand and every kind. They usually carry only maybe three or four kinds. They have to pay for the software that they use to do the testing from that hearing aid company. Um, and it's sort of like going to a shoe store. They can't carry every shoe that's manufactured. So um, I, you go to an audiologist, you can go to one that's nearest you and see it's, it's got to be kind of a personal relationship. Mm -hmm. um, some of them advertise in our newsletter. Um, so there isn't one, there isn't a recommendation per se that we can make, but you have to develop a personal relationship and um, they are all here licensed by the state. Okay, thank you. Sure. And we have copies of the newsletter at the library. Quite a few libraries do, and then people can get a copy too, can't they, um, Michelle, if they wanted to um, subscribe to you? Yes, if um, our membership is like, 
I don't know, it's $10 a year or right, something. Right, right, <laughs> and, yeah. and for that, you will be mailed uh, every month our newsletter. Uh, we don't always publish in June and I mean, July and August. Yeah. But um, this year we may and last year we did. But um, but otherwise, it comes out monthly. So it's a good deal for only, uh, you know, yeah, there's interesting articles work. in there. But you can also read it on our website. I post it every month. It's right. Yeah. No, this was wonderful. And I think Maria joined us too. I think she may not be there now, but I don't think she, no, she's not. Yeah, here. maybe she signed off. She might have signed off or so. Yeah. Well, this was wonderful, Michelle. Wow. All the information. I know I went to an audiologist a couple of years ago at um, Ginger's suggestion and learned quite a bit, but I don't think I ever got a copy of the audiogram either. So. They don't, they don't automatically give it to you. It's just like you go into your doctor's office. They don't automatically hand you your chart and say, take it home. You kind of have to ask. Um, and, but they, at least around here, I've never had a problem. Um, I ask them for a copy and they say, sure, they print sure. it out and that's it. Yeah. Unless it went to my um, primary care, I'll have to check that. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments? And I know, Michelle, you do a lot of these programs. Um, I have been. I, I'm not sure if I'll be continuing to do them in the sure. future. We have somebody else who does. I, I may, you know, but um, I, I've done I've done them for years. Uh, and it's good for me because I, it gets me keeping up with the times. You know, you're wonderful. I said that. And the way you present it, it's you know, easy to understand and answers all these questions. It looks like um, everyone, you know, got... Um, a lot of information. So thank you again. It's wonderful. Yeah. Sure. My, my pleasure. And as I said, you can always contact me if you have any other questions. And, uh, uh, you know, I, we also can, uh, I also can return a phone call. So I have a captioned phone. So, um, you know, if you write to the chapter and ask to speak with me, I can call one-on-one -on -one or we can do a Zoom. We have a, a Zoom account here. I mean, my husband and I have a Zoom account, so we can do Zoom or FaceTime or whatever, and then have a personal conversation. If you, if you or anybody you know has questions, just contact us and we can arrange for that. And this program was recorded and it will be on the Penfield um, Town website. It'll probably take about a week or so, but I can alert people if they wanted to hear it again too. So, and including uh, if there was anything in the chat, I don't believe there was. Right yeah. Now. And actually when, uh, when that happens, if you let me know, I'll put it up on our website. I will, I will do that. I will do that. It probably be, it might be about a week. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank sure, you. My thank pleasure. You, thank you, Gwen. Take Maria. care everybody. So yeah. appreciate it very much.